Welcome to this week's Future Toolbox podcast. We explore the Z to A of life skills, where each letter stands for a topic and essential tool to help you get ahead in life. Meet Jules and Mark, creators of the multi-award winning Future Toolbox, and enjoy their straightforward approach to creating growth mindsets that help people turn their dreams into realities. Whether you're a teen in education, a parent, a teacher, or part of a community group, start creating positive habits from today. Welcome to the latest Z2A podcast with me, Mark, and Jules from the multi-award winning Future Toolbox. Hello there and welcome. Now, this is where we pick a letter and a topic and discuss how you can use our tools to improve your own personal development and life. So what do we have the letter of this week? We have chosen the letter I for this episode, and that stands for interview. So it's all about how to get that positive decision from the decision maker at that interview process. Wow, that's a pretty tough ask sometimes, isn't it? But you can do it by a lot of preparation, I guess. Yes, preparation is key. Now, we're talking about interviews, and everybody always assumes job interviews straight away, but this could be an interview for a college placement, it could be an interview for a university, it could be for a volunteering position, and there's so many different decision makers that you're going to come across in life who will make a decision on you. Now, if you run your own business, technically, sometimes you have interviews for that, if you're maybe going for funding, or if you're trying to win a new client or whatever. So this is going to cover quite a lot, really, isn't it? Yeah, so it's not for your very first interview, but it's for every single interview that you may have in the future. Now, our background working in post-16 education, we obviously used to work with a lot of teenagers who were going for their first interviews. And one of the things that we always learned from that is it wasn't always about the qualification and experience. It was about the person. It was actually about the person that this decision was made on. And we would sometimes see a 16, 17, 18 year old with literally no experience at all, other than maybe a couple of weeks at schoolwork experience. And they would be a graduate and somebody who had that experience or had that qualification. And the key thing there was they would beat them on their personality. Let's have a little look at what people want. What do the decision makers want from the person who's sitting in front of them being interviewed? Well, as you were just saying, from our background in post-16 education, we actually did a survey with the employers that we were working with and we asked them, what is it that you are actually looking for? And they came back and these are the top answers that they gave us. A good attitude was top of the list. They wanted people, no matter what age they were, to have the right attitude and come across as being mature. Yeah, that totally makes sense, doesn't it? Because at the end of the day, you could have every qualification under the sun, but if your attitude's not there, it's not going to work. It's not going it? to work. <laughs> One of the second highest ones was that first impression. And we'll go into that a little bit more in this podcast. Yeah, that counts really, really mm. highly, doesn't it? Yeah. One other one that we picked up as well was the actual interest in the job and showing that you really, really want to work mm. for that person or you want to work with that person. And that also sort of doubled up with asking really, really good questions yeah. and preparing the questions that you're going to ask mm. as well. So when you went along to that job, the more questions you ask, without overly bombarding somebody, mm. of course, it shows that you're interested. It shows, I want to come and work with you. I really, really want your job. And we have one more, don't we? We do. It's about selling you. And I think we did a podcast quite recently about branding yourself and selling yourself. That's the key to helping that person decide you're the one that they want for that job. The two things that I think are key, the two P's I call them, preparing for a interview is the preparation for sure, but it's also the presentation as well. Ooh, how you present yourself yeah. and that's what we're just talking about. So let's have a look at how do you prepare for an interview? Yeah, it's one of those things you can't really wing it. You can't just think, oh, I know what I'm doing. I've been for... <laughs> 10 interviews already, I've been looking for a job for however long, I can just go along and do this. I'll wing it. Yeah, and we did talk in a previous podcast, again, you mentioned earlier about branding yourself and applying for jobs, and you have to treat every single job application, every single business presentation or interview or whatever it is, as a completely new start. I mean, obviously, use your experience from before, but each one has to be treated individually. It does. So the preparation, I think, your key, you always have to start with a blank piece of paper. 
Now, one of the things that is quite important to think about is how are you going to get there? You may or may not be able to drive. You may or may not have your own transport. If you're going to go for an interview and it's quite a long way away, you need to think, how am I actually going to get there? And even if you have got a car and you're able to drive, is there places to park nearby that you can use? That's one of the things I think is important to think about is how you're going to get there and how much time is it going to take you to get there so that you can plan it. I remember quite a few years ago when I went for a job interview for a financial services company and this guy said, I want to meet you at the, I think it was something like the Hilton Hotel or something. Mm. Sounds really posh, doesn't it? (laughs) He said, I want to meet you at the Hilton Hotel. I'll meet you in the reception. It was on a Saturday afternoon as well, which was a really bizarre time for a job interview. And I got all ready. I was prepared. I got all my stuff together, all my questions prepared. And guess what I did? I went to the wrong Hilton Hotel. No. (laughs) There was two Hilton Hotels in the area and I went to the wrong one. Now, thankfully... When I got there and realised I had enough time to get to the other one, but I was cutting it really, really fine. And from my own personal point of view there, I was really, really stressed when I got there. Now, the guy didn't know that I'd gone to the wrong interview, but it obviously affected my interview because I didn't get the job. I messed up a lot of stuff in that interview. Really, you know, you're on the the back foot then if you've got something (laughs) wrong like that before you even start. I will just flip it round actually as well. In our experience of working with post-16 education, a lot of people that we were sending from interviews were obviously relying on public transport Mm. to get there. Now, we did have on occasions where something would actually just go wrong that was out of your control. So, for example, the teenager would plan what bus they were going to get, know they were going to get there in plenty of time, get to the bus stop, bus didn't turn up, Mm. bus was late, bus broke down, whatever. We had loads and loads of things like that would happen. So obviously that does happen. The best thing to do is to actually let the person know, isn't it? Uh, Yes. (laughs) Say, look, do you know what? I've done absolutely everything I need to do to get here, but the bus has broken down or the car's broken down or the traffic's broken, whatever it is. It doesn't look great, but it's still better to do that if unforeseen circumstances do come up. And how much easier is that these days than it ever used to be? When I was first looking for jobs, if you had anything go wrong unless you were anywhere near a phone box (laughs) you had no way of letting them know i did actually have my car break down the handbrake came out oh no No. (laughs) i put the handbrake on at a stop and obviously being as strong and fit as i am i pulled the handbrake (laughs) and it came came off in my hands so that kind of made me late i didn't get the job but there you go i can't blame the handbrake but i don't think it helped joking aside and your handbrake story there (laughs) (laughs) There's also the dress code for an interview. What do you wear these days? Because it used to be a a suit and a real professional look. Do we still do that? I think not. But I also think it depends on the job and the company that you're going to for the interview, what you would wear. Not demeaning any organisation against each other, but if you were going for a Saturday job in a fast food place, you don't necessarily have to be suited and booted, I don't think, but you still need to be very smart and very, very tidy. But if you were going for a top executive job, I think then you couldn't turn up too casually dressed. I think you would have to make a really big concerted effort to impress because I think the competition would be higher. Yeah, I think you're right. Now, actually, I'm going to counter that back Mm. the other way. I remember a few years ago when I was in recruitment, there was a story in a recruitment publication about a council in Birmingham who were recruiting for refuse collectors, or sometimes people call them bin men, don't they? But these refuse collectors, they had an open day where people could go along and just talk about the different jobs and the different career opportunities. Now, there was actually five vacancies for refuse collectors. A number of people actually went along on the day wearing suits. Now, the five people that were given the job all wore suits on that day that they went Mm. for the open day. I can't remember the last time I saw somebody collecting my refuse wearing a suit. No. But the key is... It showed that good attitude, that maturity, that first impression and Mm. that ability to dress smart. People who had that extra level of pride. So maybe going back to the fast food takeaway, if you're going for an interview there, you might not need an Armani suit or some kind of designer suit. 
but just dressing smart and putting a smart jacket on it doesn't have to be a tie maybe i don't know is that a personal thing there's so much debate we could open up here but just showing that impression when you walk through the door yeah, just making sure yeah. that you are looking smart and you're looking tidy <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and what i mean for example your hair make sure your hair's tidy if you know that your hair's looking a little bit long and a bit sort of in need of a haircut get that haircut if you can get it done make yourself look very tidy and presentable so that that first impression is a good one yeah there's lots of things around judgment and prejudgment on appearances and that people will do it won't they they will do and i can say to you and i know this for a fact through my research that we have done through our employability sessions that we run is people will instantly make a decision based on your first impression it takes about five to ten seconds and if it's not a good one again you're on that back foot you won't know that but if you've made every effort to make sure that that first impression is a good one that you're presentable you're smiling when you meet that person and you've got a good solid sort of handshake or greeting with them then that first impression you've nailed it yeah, that's a really, really good point. And all this is in the preparation. We haven't even walked in the door of the interview no. until we've actually seen that person. We haven't even opened our mouth and said anything yet. <laughs> all this work has got to go along behind the scenes, behind hasn't the it? Behind the scenes. And yeah. again, how do you go about getting some questions ready for the interview? They will ask you, have you got any questions? Yeah, now this was a real key point. We used to spend a lot of time in interview preparation sessions with teenagers to say, when you go for an interview, the interviewer says to you, have you got any questions? And it normally comes at the end of the interview. It does of come course, towards the end. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's normally that, that last thing they'll say. So have you got any questions? Now we've gone from the preparation to right to the end of the interview. And this is the bit that we've got to really prepare for. If we prepare our questions really, really well, then you can't say at the end, no, I haven't got any questions. Because if you say that, it gives the impression you're not interested. And the employer wants somebody who's interested, mm. don't they? And I'll be honest with you, when I used to do a lot of interviewing for people to come and work at my training centre, this is actually one of the questions that I would ask at the beginning. We do the nice getting to know each other couple of questions. And then before I went into what the job was, I would ask them, have you got any questions? Wow. Because this is your interview as well as it is mine. And I know that might have put them under pressure, but straight away, I would know what they've done in terms of preparing. That's really, really good. Because again, I wouldn't have expected mm. to get that at the start. Here's the key bit then. So if you've prepared them questions and Jules is interviewing you and she says straight away, have you got any questions? Then you have a list of questions in front of you showing that person you're prepared. Yeah. So that's really key. If it comes at the end of the interview, there's a bit that always catches people out on this because you're a good interviewer, so the chance are you've probably answered all of my questions. What am I gonna do next? I could always go, no, I don't have any questions, but that gives me the same result. So my key bit I'm gonna do here, have you got any questions? I'm gonna reply back to you and say, actually, I do have a list of questions here. I'm gonna get my list out in front of me because I'm going to you, look, interviewer, I've prepared and written my questions down. Look at me, aren't I good? And then I'm gonna go through my questions with you and say, for example, I was gonna ask you a little bit about the job and what the job involves and who I'll be working with, but you've covered that because you've said A, B, and C. I've proved to you I've listened, and then I can also sell a little bit of benefit to you and say, you told me the team here is really lively, really outgoing, and that's the type of person I am. So I'm, again, mentioned it before, but I'm really keen to work with you. And I think that's really key because you've done your preparation, haven't you? Yeah. So one of the ways to help you get your questions together is to make sure you've got a copy of the job description and the specification because you can create them from that. And that's where you can base what you want to ask about. Make sure that you've gone through those, you know them off by heart, write your questions down and try and find out as much as you can. And equally, if the person asks you at the beginning, that interviewer is not gonna answer all those questions one by one. I used to say, right, give me your questions, tell me what you want to know. And at the end of the interview, I would say, have I covered everything? Really, I like that. And yeah. I just used to find it worked really, really well because it became a two-way interview. They got what they wanted and I got what I wanted. So if you're planning to interview somebody, there's a little tip as well. Yeah, <laughs> and you've just hit a key word there. The interview is a two-way thing because at the end of the day, you're going to take that job if you're offered it but you don't have to if you don't want to. Mm. 
wouldn't you rather be in a position for somebody to say to you, I'm offering you this job, and you could actually say, do you know what, it's actually not for me? Yeah. Because not every job is going to be for you as well. You don't have to take it because you're offered it, but you'd be in a much better position to say, no, thank you, than to actually go the other way around and think, well, I really wanted that job, but I didn't get it. So it is, yeah, a two-way thing. That's really good. Another key that I've just picked up from what you said there is I know that you're a good interviewer because obviously you were trained, you interviewed lots of people over the years, we had loads of experience in it. But the other thing to bear in mind is not all interviewers are great interviewers. No. Now you might find that you get the interviewer that comes straight into the interview, sits down with you, they're as nervous as you are, if not more nervous, Mm. and they'll start with a really open question, something like, just tell me about yourself. That is such a hard one because if somebody was to say to me, right, tell me about yourself, I would sit there and think, oh gosh, what do you want to know? Because Mm. I do this, I know that, I've worked here, I've done that. I was born in. (laughs) Yeah, where do you start? (laughs) But the way I'd answer that question is I would give them a choice of two things. So, you know, I could talk a little bit about a school project I worked on in such and such, or I could talk about my previous work experience at whatever place. And that's obviously coming from a teenage point of view. And then the person might say to you, well, actually, yeah, do you know what? I'd like to know a bit about your work experience at such and such place. And now you've nailed down what they want to hear about. And you can split that again. You could say, okay, I could tell you a little bit about the work I did in the office, or I could tell you a little bit of work I did with a customer. Which one would you like to hear first? Tell me about the work you do with customers. Now you know what to talk about. You've nailed that person down. So remember, they might not be the best interview in the world. Okay, now we've covered that really hard one that's tell me about yourself. This is another question that used to come up all the time in interviews. Why do you want this job? Yes. Now, that's a big question because then you have to explain why it is that you want this job. And saying, well, I need the money really (laughs) isn't going to get the yes that you want. The good idea is to think about this question before the interview and think about your response and be clear on why you want the job. Is it because it's something that you've been really interested in all your life or it's part of a hobby that you really like? But make sure that you give the interviewer a strong enough answer. It can't be, well, I just need a job. Now, there's something else. There's questions not to ask. Yeah. Now, you're just talking about why do you want the job? Well, I need money. That's not a good idea to ask things about that. Because if somebody says to you, have you got any questions? Yeah, how much do I get paid? Or what benefits do I get? How much holiday do I get? When can I take my breaks? And believe it or not, we used to get loads of people that would ask these questions and think they were the most important questions. Uh. The one that always used to really, really floor me was when people would say, I need to find out if I get paid when I'm off sick. Stuff like that, they're all important. You don't want a job that's not going to pay you or give you holidays. If you are off sick, then yeah, it is a good idea to be paid or have something. But they're probably not the forefront of the questions to ask. And again, money can sometimes be a bit of a touchy subject because I've seen it from the other side where people went, well, how much money are you looking for? The interviewer said that. And again, it's a difficult one to answer, really. A lot of jobs do actually advertise a salary on them, but some of them don't. And it is quite difficult. It is difficult. But I think Mm. these questions at your initial interview are not really the ones to ask. If they offer you the job or if they call you in for a second interview or possibly another one or they want you to meet some of the team, it's not too disappropriate to talk about these things then because it's looking likely that you're on the short list. These things might be important to you. I mean, sick pay might be important to you if you've got a family and you need to know whether you get sick pay. Because if you are off, then you need to know that you've still got some money coming. So it is important to you, but it's not the thing to ask on the first interview. And also, it's much, much easier to negotiate that when you've been offered the job. Yes, yeah. Because if somebody offers you the job and says, right, I'm going to offer you X amount of money, Mm. this is where you can actually then have a negotiation with that person. If needed. If needed. Yeah, Yeah, of course. Going right back to the start of this podcast episode, we looked at those five things that employers want. We talked about the good attitude and mature. We've covered that. We also covered about the first impressions, how to dress, asking good questions and showing your interest in the job. And we also talked a little bit about branding yourself. Now, we do have a whole podcast on that about branding yourself. So it's a good idea to go back and listen to that one as well. But just to really very lightly touch on that, 
I think it is about thinking of yourself as a product and selling your features and benefits mm. to that interviewer. Thinking about what is it that you've done and what is it that you can offer them from yes, that. Yeah. For example, I worked in a fast food takeaway. I worked with customers on the front desk. I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't my most favourite job in the world and it's not something I wanted to do forever. However, what I got from it was working under pressure because it was always busy. I had to be super friendly because the customers were coming in. They would always appreciate it if they got a smile on the till. And the, the third thing I really loved about it was the team. We had such a buzz. We had such fun because we were in a busy environment. We were allowed to look out for each other. Now, I've just sold a lot of benefits to that person because you want a person like me that deals with all of those things. So I think if we can give that person what they want, then we're in a better position to get yeah. a yes from the decision maker. And that goes back to checking the job description and specification and seeing what skills you've got that match what's in there and how you sell that and tell that interviewer those skills that you've got. That's how you sell yourself. That's exactly how you as do it. As simple as that. So. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and all I can ask is that if anybody listening, if you've got an interview coming up and you listen to this and take on board these skills, let us know how you get on. Yeah, we'd love to find out we'd and also to. reach out if you need a hand with anything. But you can get that straight away by going to our beautifully branded website, which is futuretoolbox.co.uk. There's loads and loads of tools and tips on there. We're also on social media on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. TikTok. We also have a YouTube channel and we're on LinkedIn because we are everywhere. And we look forward to catching you on the next episode. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us for the Z2A of Life Skills with Jules and Mark of the Future Toolbox. Don't forget to head over to their website, which is futuretoolbox.co.uk, where you can find lots of free resources, plus a host of books in the store, as well as subscribing to the membership site. Follow Future Toolbox Instagram, TikTok and Facebook at Future Toolbox and subscribe to their YouTube channel too.